presume we've reached a stage where we're, we're going we're to go out and try and really buy a horse. And it's not one that we've been leasing. Because ideally what would happen is you would lease horses with the idea that a portion of the money that you utilize to lease the horse would be applied to the purchase of the horse. Okay. Now some operations don't do that and I can understand that. It's, it's very difficult to find horses that fulfill the obligation of non-riders or green riders or inexperienced polo players stepping on them and having the horse perform and not begin to degenerate in its overall performance. So let us go on to the assumption that we've decided we're going to purchase a horse. Purchasing a horse is in a similar nature to buying a car in the sense that you should know what you don't want rather than what you do want to start with. Because if we go with the attitude of, I'm looking for a Palomino gelding that's eight years old and 15 to, and we find this Palomino gelding that's eight, three, eight years old and 15 to, and he plays a little polo, but he also kicks, he also pulls back, he also bucks, he also is a stud horse. You've purchased what you want, but you've also gotten that package a whole bunch of things you don't want. My personal belief is that you should know what you don't want first. I don't want horses that are over 15'3". I don't want mares. I don't want stud horses. I don't want horses that crib. I don't want grays. Whatever. And that means you eliminate something immediately and causes neither you nor the individual who's trying to sell the horse to you aggravation. Also, it establishes parameters around which you really, truly are looking for a horse. Each individual sale is exactly that individual sale. There is no write-up that's handed out to sellers saying, this is what you do to show a horse. Generally speaking, though, here's what, what most sales are going to entail. It comes to the knowledge of an individual, or you have informed an individual that you're looking for a certain kind of horse. Either that individual possesses that horse or knows someone who does. Now the question is, at that particular point, are you going to utilize that individual's information as an agent? If so, the chances are you should assume the fact that you're going to pay him some form of compensation for him being your agent. If you're not, then you should make it real clear. Guess what? I'm not, I appreciate you letting me know, but... I'm not using as an agent, and I don't, and, or you can use it as mannerly as you want, saying, so are we looking for something out of this, or what's really going to, what's going to, what, what are we looking at? Number two, the overriding controlling factor above all else is cost. So before anything else takes place, you need to know what your maximum willingness to spend entails. Unfortunate as it may be, once you've let that know, it's amazing the number of horses that are brought to the forefront, they're exactly that amount. Presuming that you found an agent, it is up to the agent to cull everything that doesn't fit what you're looking for and not have you spend in your time, effort, money, emotion, and opportunities stepping on livestock that doesn't even meet what you're looking for. Once a horse has been established as a potential purchase, a potential purchase. Across the board, you should be given a maximum of three opportunities on that horse before you presume that you either have to make a, a deadline decision or you have to start paying for the opportunity to get on that horse again. Those three opportunities should entail one, a ride, two, a stick and ball session, and three, a chuck. Or the last two are both chuck. If after three rides you really don't know whether you want this horse or not, you need to sit down with yourself with a mirror, look in the mirror and say, what's keeping me from buying this horse? And is it going to change by me riding this horse the next time? Because if it's not going to change, then you've already given yourself the answer. Mm -hmm. And if you opt to go back the fourth time, I would be very surprised if the seller unless they are either desperate or like the way you ride or willing to have you step on the horse again. If you find a 
stopper on the first ride, then step off the horse, express your appreciation for the opportunity, and say it's not what I'm looking for. If the seller then asks what's the problem, you may say that I am unable to, quote, whatever, unable to stop the horse, I, I, the horse does not respond in the manner that I can ride. It's best not to turn around and place the onus responsibility on the horse. If a true professional salesman is there, chances are he's not going to take it personally. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not professional salesmen. They have a horse for sale and they will take it personally. I am a proponent for you finding an agent. I am a proponent for you paying for the agent. I am a proponent for you avoiding spending time looking at livestock that does not does not fulfill your commitments of what you're looking for. After the commitment to purchase the horse has been made, then you determine what, if any, form of medical examination you wish the horse to go under. Buying a horse for $95,000 will entail probably a greater degree of veterinary commitment than buying a horse for $500. But also, if that $500 represents 50% of your ability to pay totally, then you probably are going to want to pay quite a bit of veterinary medicine to see to it that $500 purchase is what you want it to be. How you approach that examination, the soundness examination, is dependent on you and the veterinarian. If this horse has been performing under stress conditions continually and has the ability to trot out on Monday morning, after a hard weekend of polo, and looks good, in my opinion, that's 90% of the soundness. If you came to me and you said, my entire string just got killed with a lightning strike. I have X amount of money that I can spend and I say you have ample amount of money to repurchase those horses. And then you say, I need to be ready in 90 days. And I tell you, I wish you a lot of luck, Godspeed, and ain't a snowball's chance in hell. Okay. Unless you are looking for the common denominator horse on the lowest end that is basically the donut horse I talked about before. As your expectations go up, then your quality and number of opportunities go down because you are eliminating not horses arithmetically, but you're eliminating horses logarithmically. You had six mares, all of them six dead. I can find you three geldings and three mares. I don't want three geldings. I found, you know, I want four horses that are all 15-1. I can find you two that are 15-1, one, one that's 15-3, and one that's 15. I have an individual here who has now taken lessons from me, who's purchased five horses over six years from me. Okay? He gave me one year's notice of what he was looking for. Now, for twice what he's paid, I could have gone out and found him one for twice what he's paid. But he gave me a year, I produced the horse. If you have an unlimited amount of economic capability to spend, then that means we can contact every place in North America and every place in the world to find what you're looking for. But you are going to pay for that. You are not going to pay a true and just price. You are going to pay what's required to get it 